if you're insisting on measuring whatever thing for music making, mixing, or mastering, you should know what meters mean. This is a video on how to work span on how and how to look for the proper information and how to actually read the information given from span. Uh, straight from Mexico City, my name is Juanchis, and today we will be working with this example. You can probably realize by now that my span looks a little bit different. So let's jump right into the menus and talk about something that some of the things that you will actually use. First of all, I highly suggest that you just change the routing into stereo, like just go for that. And that should really make things easier for you. And for now, I'm going to hide the meters and the stats. I won't be using those. Remember that when you're trying to measure things, you're looking always at a whole frequency spectrum in this scenario, given a certain amplitude. So for example, if you're trying to figure out whether the bass is fighting over the space with a kick drum, it's not only a matter of if they are in the same frequency range, but how high are they? My suggestion is that you should always pick one that goes lower than the other. So it actually supports the whole mix or the whole production. Sometimes it might work where both of them are more or less sharing the low end, but they have to complement each other as they go further ahead within this. One of the things that's really, really important when you're trying to measure things and trying to obtain some extra information is time. And that's what we call a window in audio engineering. So <clears throat> right here, you can always change how long will the measurement be? For example, if you're looking for small spikes of something that really pops within the mix or within whatever signal you're working with, what you want to do is have a lower time measurement because the result in the graph is a measurement across that amount of time. So if I'm measuring 300 milliseconds, that's three full seconds, and a transient is only 60 milliseconds or less, when this result comes out, that transient won't be presented as it should be. You won't get so much information in the graph from the transient. So if I make this measurement 10 times smaller, 300 milliseconds, just as a VU meter, look at how the dynamics of the drums really show up. But if I go all the way back to three seconds, That measurement of three seconds is so much more helpful when I'm trying to find out how is my energy building up in the lows, in the mids, or in the highs. That's what you should be using the three seconds uh, window for measurement. If you're looking precisely for some spikes of things, for some uh, clarity or of where the drums are, you should probably be thinking of 300 milliseconds because that relates a lot more to the VU meters and that relates with the brain with something called the auditory critical period. And that means that the brain takes 250 milliseconds to start averaging whatever sound came out. That's why transients are always perceived as a sudden burst of energy and not as something that you can average over time with your brain. That way, if you're looking for a measurement that relates more on how the graph might represent how your ear is averaging the, the way sound starts to gather in different zones of the frequency range, you should probably go for more or less this number. But again, if you're looking for a tonal balance kind of thing, I highly recommend going into, into the three seconds realm, or as I like to call it, the tonal contour of the, of the music or the sound. So let's go back to the 300 milliseconds. And you can also modify a couple of other things to find information. This block size, what it does, it's dividing from the 20 hertz to the 20K, how much is you're going to see the frequency range really split. If I go into a 256 block size, you're going to see like chunks of, of things floating around related, related to the music. And 
and I have this really high peak here of the snare and I have this bass and this kick drum really floating over here but there's not much definition for example from the piano that I can see with this kind of block size with this block size <laughs> You can more or less see it right here across the 700 to 1K, but if I increase the block size, I can try to look for more information between those frequencies. I wish I could use the vocal version of it or most vocal versions so we could do a much better uh, explanation of this. But you know how copyright is, so I really don't want to get in, prop in any trouble. And I'm going to increase again the block size, maybe to 4000. And look how the definition, for example, in the low end for the kick drum and the bass really starts to get a lot more clear. You can even now see over here the hi-hats going like ch -ch 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 -ch, and the snare hitting here on the two and the fours. And that's why we use block size. So my suggestion is that for most uses, I'm not trying to look at the spectrum analyzer for finding out really small or uh, resonance or really small things that are popping out. I am mostly looking at it so I can know where my tonal contour is heading. That's why I like to place it at 3000 or three seconds with a bigger block size so it averages even better. As you can see, I also have this smooth turn on. Let me turn it off and then turn it on. If I go into a much smaller block size, I'm getting a much smoother version of this curve. It doesn't do the same thing as the smooth because this only starts defining more the space be between frequencies, as I just said. But this doesn't really help me in some ways. So what I want to do is to know how my energy is building up across the frequency range. So as audio engineering tradition dictates, I, I think one third per octave uh, is a really helpful way of looking at it. That way, you're always looking at small sections that usually are so much more related to this kind of graphic equalizer. That way, you can easily find out if you are having too much of the 63 or having too much of the 315 and how to readjust this contour so it fits better and works better within the genre or the style that you're working with. So that's why I use the smooth one third. That's the most basic use of it, but let's go a little bit deeper into it. Right here, you can see that I'm using something that's called RTFG. So that means real-time average. That's why it's moving so fast, even though I'm having a three-second measurement. I could look for the three-second average time, but not peak-related, but for the average, and that's much more related to the RMS. And now I can see that I have this huge bulk over here because I have a really bass heavy track. One beautiful thing that you can do with a span is that you can have two spectrums. So you could have one spectrum that's holding this average of this, uh, in, of this frequency range use. And you can have a second spectrum activated right here for the max real time or the max historically. I usually like to use the real time max because that way I can control more or less some history of what I have seen for the last three seconds. And even with this thing, I can do something that I think it's pretty nifty and a really nice trick. So what I will do is I will hover over this hold button. I'm going to hit play and look what, I, what we will do. Okay, now I have a screenshot of a certain section of my song. And this is showing the real-time max and the average over time. 
this is a really interesting way of looking at it because now I can see the dynamics per band and not just the dynamics as some sort of measurement here in the master track where I'm relating the peak to the RMS looking at this crest factor kind of old school idea that's still useful but maybe for music production in 2023 is not the easiest way to get information this way you can not only see how much information you have average wise but you can see how much information or how the dynamics are relating in a certain frequency range that way you can also find out if you have too much of 300 but it's not just too much it's clo so close to the peak that it's masking itself all of the time if i compress this a lot more if, if i limit and if i lower the dynamic range I can really, really manipulate this graph. Let me add a compressor and I'll show you. Okay, so I'm going to turn on the RC inflator, that simulation of the Oxford inflator uh, in the RIA pack. I say that it's a uh, stock, stock plugin. I know some people don't like that idea because it's not as you download it, but for my dictionary, it works. Like you just have to go into extension, RIA pack and download it. What you will see is that now I have this two spectrums analyzing real-time average and real-time max. That way I can compare how my dynamics are being crushed frequency-wise because now I have a relationship of the peak and the average or the RMS across three seconds. So look more or less where the peaks and the RMS stand. Let's hit play. More or less, it's hovering across this minus 36 and across this 25, 26. So we have more or less a 10 dB dynamic range for this. And once I turn this off and I reanalyze it, I can see that I have minus 24 and minus 38. So that's a lot more than 10 dB. So I'm actually crushing the dynamics of it. And it's an, inter an interesting way of looking at the span as a way of measuring your dynamics across the frequency range. In any case, you could open up the meters and the stats and look at the crest factor and how it's going to change. But this doesn't give you any information of how the dynamics are across the, the, the frequency range. It's only a number that relates to another thing that I don't find way too interesting for this example. That's why I have it hidden. Not only that, I could also think that most of the times I will have some sort of limit that I'm hitting. And from that limit, the things that are in the average will start pushing into that limiter. So let's look how it not only adds distortion, but it actually crushes the dynamics. So I'm really going to push it, like really, really going to push it. So I actually hit this. And now, as you can see, I'm hitting minus 49 and my more or less minus 38. But this part of the curve is really, really crushed. It's not preserving that more or less 10 dB dynamic range across the spectrum. Because dynamics is a consequence of arrangement and silences uh, split and spread out across the range of the instruments. So <clears throat> using the span to look at dynamics across the frequency range is a use that I haven't seen people talk about. There are a lot of other things that we can learn from this uh, free plugin. I can make another video on how to use different routings because I think this can easily turn into a 40 minute video that most people won't watch until the end. So if you're interested in that, please hit that notification bell, hit that subscribe button, and please let me know in the comments that you're enjoying these kind of videos. These are only some of the interesting uses that I have found for the span, for the span plugin that I'm going to be linking in the description of this video. Uh, I think you should stop obsessing with what the meter says and just try to use better the references that you have at hand. And if you need to do uh, some sort of metering plugin, you should really invest some time in learning what does that measurement actually mean instead of just watching at it uh, and making some decisions because probably you're not making the best decision if you don't know how time is affecting what you're looking at. So straight from Mexico City, my name is Juanchis and thanks for listening.